Good morning. Thank you all for coming to this session. I'm Crystal Smith. I'm from Southeastern Oklahoma State University, and I'll be moderating. If you have any questions, especially those of you on uh, Zoom, I'll be watching the chat to make sure that your questions get asked in here. Um, or if any of you, even in the room, if you're using the Zoom platform and would like to ask your questions through chat, I'll be watching on there. Kathy Ed Miller is from Oklahoma State University and will be presenting this session. Brad actually mentions this in the previous session. We have all of these great resources for students, but how do we let them know? How do we make sure that the, this information is communicated to them so that those who need this service are able to access it? So their university has found a solution. They're going to be sharing that with us. So this session is course marking at Oklahoma State University, and I'll turn it over to the end. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. It'll wave. <laughs> <laughs> so good morning. So she mentioned I'm Kathy S. Miller, and last name is E S S M I L E R. Uh, and some of you may know Robert Kennedy, who's the director of advising at OSU OKC, uh, and she. I was a band director. <laughs> and so I said, I'm going to use my football field voice. So, um, stay close to my next week. I didn't tell you that that's all. So, um, so we here we're here. Okay, I'll just depend on it. It won't all work together. So, I'll leave it back. I'll the so this is, I'll tell you, on the post end of this. Uh, it looks just enough different than regular Zoom to be a problem. So, like, if you're all in just like our regular Zoom, we so know exactly where you're going to mute and stuff like that. So, that's why it's not that all of a sudden our innovation team can't work Zoom. It's our innovation team is piloting a new Zoom events kind of thing, and the buttons are in different places. And I don't know, my son is in, this is not part of the talk. This is me practicing, I'm talking slowly, quietly, but my son is a developer, computer programmer. Uh, out in Phoenix, and I think you can check and speak to this. One of the developer codes is uh, don't optimize. And if you have to optimize, don't do it yet. And then James puts an addendum on there and, and says, because somewhere my mom is on Zoom and can't find the hang up button because it's a different size because we changed it by two pixels. And now she's stuck in that new graph. So, <laughs> Chat and said, So, why do you guys keep doing that? You know, I know. So, uh, anyway, um, we're glad to have you here. For those of you in the Zoom room, uh, looks like we got about 25 people maybe in the room. I'm not great with numbers. Looks like about six round tables kind of staggered throughout the room. Uh, and for those of you here in the room, we have about 18 participants in line. So, just kind of to give you a sense of who all is in here together. Uh, and I probably I might look into the chat, but I'm so afraid to mess this setup up. So uh, <laughs> you got it. Okay. So uh, feel free to speak up if anyone has questions or comments, or when they have questions and comments, they're also in the teacher shoes uh, as, as we went through this. So um, this is the only slide. So you're welcome. And um, there's a couple reasons for that. Um, one is I hate to run the slides while I'm speaking on Zoom. And so I usually try to find a collaborator who loves to do slides. Uh, but this time it's just so you get one slide. Uh, so that's one reason I'm lazy and afraid that I don't like to do slides to, to you know, move through because then you lose the chat or anything. But the other reason, the one that's more legitimate, is uh, I'd like for this to be a dynamic, nimble, flexible conversation. Uh, it's not so much me saying this is how we did it and how you should do it, but I'll give a quick overview of what brought us to course marking, how we implemented it. Uh, kind of our lessons learned, our hopes and dreams. And then I'd love for us, since these grants are available in the spring, to work towards a full course market at your institution, to maybe take some time that we can answer questions and kind of meet together and get each other a head start on that. So, um, questions so far? Also, if I start to talk too fast, when I start to talk too fast, give me a heads up. Sasha say that is not good speech communication. Slow down. <laughs> so, um, all right. So at Oklahoma State University, and I think you probably heard our story, but um, in 2013, the library integrated open and OER intentionally into their strategic plan. 
and we had uh, a couple really passionate librarians who were working on this, uh, and it was kind of a series of projects. And then um, the librarian that was spearheading most of them passed away uh, abruptly, and um, then they hired me. And with that, when they hired me, the goal was to build a sustainable program to take these a series of projects and turn it into a program so it can move, you know, so it's not tied to a person or this, right? We want to gain it out with it. And um, so since then, we've, we've built this program, which is the whole other presentation, but part of it, oh, I've got to get the search. Um, part of our long range plan is included, well, we have several little kettles boiling with possibility. And so I have a lot of things ready to go the second someone says the sentence I need to set in front of the audience I need to set. And one of the skills that was born was Porsche. So I, um, in order to build a possible Porsche monkey workflow, uh, I talked to the people at K-State because they've had it implemented for a long time. Uh, or K-State does it. And there's a wonderful Rebus publication I think Michelle Reed was an editor uh, about course marking. So I think if you just Google course marking OER, that book will come up. And it's case studies from a variety of different institutions about how they went about doing it. So that also gives uh, a lot of first. So I drew from that also. So I had our trial kind of workflow design. And that's what this QR code goes to. If you scan it and go on, this doesn't look like a presentation, then you are in the right place. Uh, you sh it should take you to the chapter um, in our book, open. Right, it's Brad, probably saying that Kathy talks about it. Did you hear it cut off the mic? Uh, it's saying it, it takes it to the book, Exploring Open, and it should be the chapter that details how we go about our course marking. And I've tried to write it informally so that our faculty will engage with it and we didn't kind of understand uh, what we're doing and how we're going about it. So that's what uh, that's where that QR code goes. And uh, I invite you to put in skim through that and have that and more questions you might have, but I'll also share out loud about the process. And if someone is participating, wants to drop the link in the chat to that in case people are just watching one device and, and can't grab the QR code, I meant to have it handy uh, But I'd also like to give thanks, as we move forward, to the online consortium of Oklahoma, as well as OpenOK State for funding my attendance and participation uh, in this conference. So we've got the kettle boiling. I've got the workflow, travel workflow ready. So push go on when someone said the right thing. Um, and we've mentioned it as a possibility to the registrar and administration a couple times and kind of got mm, mm, mm. and then uh, we have uh, an OER advisory group that we had a student representative on. And the idea was that the student representative would attend every time. And as students and humans do, he, he did. Uh, but he did come one time. And so one of the reasons I share that is to invite you to find victories and even these small moments that like the story isn't this kid never came. It's the story is the one time this kid came, gave us exactly what we needed to make this really big thing happen. And so he was at the, the advisory group meeting when you're talking about OER and uh, the kid, but that, that sounds to me that the student there you go, said, wow, I really wish I knew when I enrolled which courses did not require textbooks. And I said, thank you. <laughs> that is, and I had scripted, I had edited him or anything. It's just like, that is exactly what I need. And it, and it happened to be a well attended meeting. And um, the registrar said, well, I think we can do that. And she said, maybe we should work towards like developing a workflow or, and I said, or we can do this. Here's the workflow, ready, ready. And um, so the fact that it came from a student, uh, so that's a great example of how amplifying student voice makes a big difference in how administration and some of the people that don't have time, like registrars, will choose to spend their time. And it was in the middle of, oh, it was probably, I don't know if it was 21 or 22, it was in that span of time when we know our registrars were already upside down, right? Having to change things in the catalog so much. She was still, because the students said that, but willing, or maybe it's because we're already a mess, you know, they're already having to be flexible and responsive, but it was easy to put through that. But, um, so on the technical side of it, I'm not sure exactly what 
buttons and things that they push. I think our IT folks are involved, but the only reason I really know that is because when you browse our catalog, there, so you can register for classes, you can browse, and you can prepare. I think we use, oh, Brightspace for our course catalog. Mm, I don't know. Seems like it, but I'm not sure. Um, so you can browse, prepare, and register. And in one of those, you can't see the app, the OER attribute. I can't believe it, but I can't remember it's prepare or browse. You can see it when you register. And that has, that's something that has to be like written in by IT. Uh, and we haven't pushed for that yet because I already have we feel like, well, we can see it two places already. That we just need to tell the students this is where you can see it. Um, so uh, I'm not positive exactly what they do on their end to make it happen. But if you're working towards, if you want to apply for one of these grants, you can email me and I can put you in conversation with the people that do know. And, and they can tell you, then people who understand the same words can talk to each other and, and it will happen quickly. Uh, so when the registrar came back and uh, she, created kind of a, a proof of concept, and she had labeled it OER as the attribute. Well, we wanted to include everything, any class that doesn't require purchase of a commercial textbook. Oh. Obviously not all of those are OER. Some of them are digital, our resources the library provides. Some of them are just our faculty that don't use, make their kids buy a textbook. They have all their own stuff, but they're not gonna put it out as an OER, um, and a variety of things. But, but she had created the proof of concept using the words OER, uh, and she said, this fits on the page. They don't have to scroll to the right. And I said, okay. So that's also like, I, you know, back, I had to back up and go, how much do I care about uh, the definition of OER and who I'm, you know, well, less than I care about the students being able to tell and less than I care about introducing and a recall into this and might complicate it and it not happen. So uh, the label is OER. I wish you were a cute little book icon like a or like a K State or something like that. But so we have OER. Not all of them are OER, but we're okay with that, right? And who knows that besides the OER like very many people. Probably no one, which is exciting and depressing. So I need to do a better job of yes teaching people that OER. But our pipeline uh, is uh, a little exhausting because it does. So we started this right sustainable program with the hopes that if someone catches the flu and disappears, it will go on. And right now, I'm I am very much in the center of this, uh, and so we've got to figure out how that isn't the case. Um, but right now, we the deadline for me to have the stuff to the registrar, the information about courses. We're going to go and say using OER, although we all. We have a shared exchange, that's not what's happening, right? They're just not requiring Christian courses. Um, my deadline is the fifth week of this semester uh, for me to have that material to them. And I have a spreadsheet I complete that, the, like the final thing I send her has like four columns and I think she ingests it. That's the word she uses. I'll ingest the report and get back to you with it. Hers. Okay, so there's a lot of technical stuff over here that I don't know what's happening. Uh, but for me, personally, we start advertising um, so like I'll start talking about it probably end of November, beginning of December, uh, saying, hey, who is your, should your portion be marked, you want your portion be marked, uh, and then I have a form, a mock form that they complete that gets emailed to me, and I can export that as an Excel sheet, and then I can, I usually create another copy of that and delete the columns that the registrar doesn't want, because I do want their email address, you know, there's a lot of information I do want that they don't want, so I can track it. Uh, so I send it out down to exactly what it means, and then email that to her. And then she's able to run the report and comes back to me and says, these classes don't exist. And then I remediate it. So uh, the first couple of times we ran that report, there were a lot of classes that I that didn't exist. Um, and so I'm like, okay, somehow I'm not getting the actual information. Something else I ran into is uh, when I would talk to faculty who wanted their courses marked, one of the things that I have to give the registrar is the CRN, that five-digit number, six-digit number that's specific to the section. Uh, and so faculty would say, well, I'll know my CRN after the catalog's published. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so that, that's not, <laughs> that's not that, no. And I said, someone knows your CRN, who is it? And they're like, we don't know. And so I had to drill down and figure out who knows this here. Well, let's say admin assistants, right? That person actually runs the department that isn't department head. Oh, yeah. They're who usually have the CRN. 
And so I had, we had the pilot semester. The next semester I contacted all those admin assistants and we did a lot of stuff to find CRNs. And then I accidentally found out we have a CLS usage report um, that has all of this, it has every class that they've already told the registrar is gonna be taught that has all the CRNs. All right, so I was able then the next semester to quit bugging the admin assistants quite so much. And I was able to check it against that report and I'm happy to say this semester we had zero errors. So, but it also took a lot of time. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of Kathy as a musician looking at an Excel spreadsheet. So if you're looking for things that don't match, that is one. Um, and it's also still a lot of Kathy as So what I would like to do now is find where in this process the people who run the departments, the admin assistants, um, are sending the information to the registrar. And I would like to, in that step, include, have OER in that that they send, which is earlier in the process, and I think it'll still require another level where I come in on, you know, but I think that that's how I'd like to shift the workflow, but I haven't, I haven't exactly figured out how to do that, right? Um, so that's right now what we do. So the things that we miss um, are, since the fifth week is a deadline, um, and the reason it's a deadline is because they need to have it populated for enrollment. And they can't make changes to it once students have started enrollment. Um, and I don't know if that's law or tech. I don't know which one it is. But um, we don't catch changes made, uh, for instance, when they bring in adjunct faculty. So an adjunct faculty member may come in and use OER and we aren't able to catch that. Um, we don't necessarily catch new hires. Uh, we don't catch another big thing. How many courses? If they added a course to the program after this. But I think that will, I think we'll get to the point where we clear that up. The registrar is willing to run the report one more time, I think right before classes start. Um, but I also want, I want to make it as easy on the registrar as I possibly can. So I also keep a, a, a page in my lib guide, which is library web pages. Um, that list classes that I understand are not using commercial resources. So, for instance, when I hear from a faculty member, and I'm going to go and see this is a success, who's frustrated because she reported her course as using no commercial resources. The course never changed after she reported it, which meant the CLS usage report didn't show the course that I had as happening. So her course didn't get marked, and she emailed me very frustrated. Why is it my course marked? That, that that sucks. And so yeah, because I didn't I didn't know about the number change is why it's not marked. But here's this page I have where I'll lit and I'll put your course on that list and the children the students talk to each other. But so that's another opportunity for me remediation. And I'm also choosing to see it as hey, the faculty are starting to care if their courses are marked, which is really we're gonna see that as a positive and mark that as evidence uh, that that they're glad to have this happening and they like to see it happy. Um so in a nutshell, I start advertising the last month of the previous semester, send out the form, give the information to the registrar the fifth week of the semester, field emails from faculty frustrated because they didn't get their courses marked, go yay, and then start kind of re-upping for the next semester. Places to improve are to move this maybe earlier in the course flow um, and tie it to that one report so that Audrey's not having to have a whole nother thing that she has to do. So those are kind of future goals uh, that we have. So I think hopefully I did that quickly enough that we have time to answer questions. Uh, what questions do you have or ideas or complications? Do you see how can we help you get this money? But if we did, I'm going to take this off the thing. So it's going to make noise. Sorry, Zoom people, if you want to mute your audio for a second, okay. Did you receive any pushback from faculty that didn't want other faculty to be rewarded, especially with higher numbers in classes for OER? So I've had pushback when I was in the like, well, that means more people are not going to enroll in my class because it has a textbook and it's good to pay for it. That'd be great. That'd be a great question. Thank you for asking that. So I'm in the very fortunate position at Oklahoma State of being the person who came second to talk about all this. 
So I think the first librarian got a lot of pushback. So all the sure. no's have been said. So I've gotten to come in after everybody sat with it for a while and see the benefits. So there's a lot of pushback I'm not having to deal with, but it doesn't have anything to do with me. It's, it's luck because someone already was there. Um, but it is a concern that is raised regularly. And I, I don't necessarily think OER is appropriate for every single class. When you've got one professor teaching 300 students, they need an auto grade, right? We want our faculty to go home and have dinner and hang out with their cat or whatever they have. And, um, and so that's one of the things I also say. We also want them to be able to keep their jobs. And so the, when I do hear things like that, um, and, and yes, I, I hear you, I understand, and you're right. That, that's, a real, that's a real issue for watching the numbers. And if it looks like that starts happening, We'll figure out how to address that. Is it is it to say, well, maybe you should switch to OER. Maybe you should use the same book. That's one option. Or you know what else? Because we don't want to do additional. We don't want to do more. You know, for departments. So that's that's a good question. When it's raised, I listen. I say I'm tracking the numbers. We'll let you know if it looks like that happens and figure out what to do. This is also because we get there. I'm sorry if you addressed this already and I missed it, but um, so we're doing um, a survey of students right now on the perception of the OER that they've used in their courses. And something that I've noticed just kind of looking through the comments so far as these surveys are coming in is um, like a, a, a specific kind of negative comment was the assumption that they never had access to that material again, as they would a physical book. Um, so I'm wondering, <laughs> Like for your experience or anybody in the room with course markings, like when they can they click on that? So there's a fair definition of what that means for their own retention abilities. Um, are faculty being asked when you put this in the course? Um, I know I haven't asked them to do it. <laughs> um, you know, ways to encourage a definition of what they can continue to do with that material. Once that class is over, if they want to retain it, make sure you're doing the download or saving it or whatever. I'm just curious on the course markings of if there's a way to click on it and kind of see that definition ahead of time so they can understand what and and with yours, since it's so kind of across different types of material, that probably doesn't work so well. But that's something I'm kind of seeing in the survey that's like reminding me of more um things that we need to address as far as uh, educating students too. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. That was, that was Andrea. Thank you for sharing that. No, and I hear that, that we need to educate our students and make sure that the students know what resources they can retain. And so thank you for that. Identify the gap I considered. I don't think I will try to get a red shark to link anything else. I'm just so grateful it's happened. Um, but we do maybe have some opportunities with our bookstore to do things like that. Uh, but definitely communicating in places where they're using OER. And how awesome that the students want to keep their textbooks. Sorry, on a similar, well, on a similar note, um, I was wondering earlier too, for students who need a physical textbook for access reasons, what are we, what are we doing for them? And, and I love that you're asking that. It's very timely. I'm in a team's conversation right now where that is going to be the sentence that I need to make what I want to have happen happen. So we, uh, our OER are able to export physical copies. Um, and we're also, I, I can push it to Lulu to print as a book. Um, in issues where it's only digital, in issues isn't the right word in the brain world, so sorry, uh, it means a different thing. Uh, in instances, there we go, where there are, if they have a, it's on, a, it's not an IP, but you know what I'm talking about? Accommodation. The accommodation, safety. there is a service that will provide school books. And I don't remember the name of it, but if you'll email Christina Calhoun, a C O L Q U H O U N at OSU, she'll know. Also, Able Tech. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for asking. Able Tech. Able Tech is who you need to go to. Okay. Yeah. So, Kathy, right now we show in our bookstore and <laughs> no materials are required to be purchased. Mm -hmm. Do you do that also? And so the course marking is. Like in another place where students can learn that. Thank you. you do both. Right. So we um let our bookstores hard. It supports our university in a lot of ways. We have our own bookstore and it, it's 
profit's not the right word to use. I'm not in business. Revenue <coughs> supports uh, supports the student union. So that's code for it's a crunchy relationship. So um, we have spoken to them about putting something in there that says they're using OER library resources. They're not super excited to do that, but we are in the process of getting something that says something besides no textbook required. So they know right now what's happening for the bookstore is that they are getting reports from those faculty. And so it's the textbook. So we're trying to come in and say, hey, we can help get rid of that for you. We can get you closer to 100% report if you'll give us if this is line. But right now, it's word of mouth, the live guide IP, and the course mark is where they're mostly able to find it out. Thanks for asking that. That's a useful question. We're out of time. So if you have more questions, I'm sure she would love to talk more, but in five minutes till the next session, so we'll be able to let, let, let everybody get moved around in the next session. How much is the course mark in the There's better than six. I'm not sure. The price the 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 funding that's being offered um this year for either course marking or there's another use that could be for I guess Stay in contact with your SEO rep. Keep an eye on the stuff that grass and stuff. Because there's money for, for university institutions that are wanting to move towards us. That's what 